Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Florida Food Policy Council's monthly Florida Food Forum, hosted by the Policy Committee of the Council. I am Del Deschamps, uh, the host of the forum. We do welcome everyone joining on cyber systems uh, and on phone lines, and we welcome all who may be viewing this again uh, through the uh, magic of our recording device. Um, our topic for this month is urban agriculture. Uh, and with us from the council is the council's operation and communications facilitator, and that's Kendra Love. Kendra will handle the technical and managerial aspects of our meeting. Uh, we want to take just a moment and let everyone know that the Florida Food Policy Council relies on donations, memberships, and sponsorships for our operations. We are a chartered not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing the health and security of the Florida food system. So please share support through the donation link on our website, or you can send us a check. <laughs> For information on sponsoring a, a future forum, uh, please see the website or contact Kendra directly if you would like to sponsor a Florida Food Forum, just like what we're doing today. Uh, we are pleased to recognize two sponsors for today's forum. One is FEED and the other is Jay Haskins Law. FEED stands for Food for Health, the Environment, Economy, and Democracy. FEED is based in Fort Lauderdale, and it is a consultancy dedicated to the ideals of its name. It specializes in food systems planning, GIS analysis, advocacy, and education about food systems and healthy communities. The contact for FEED is Anthony Oliveri. Jay Haskins Law is located in Tampa and empowers communities with the legal and risk management tools needed to exercise food sovereignty. The contact for Jay Haskins Law is Jesse Haskins. We're acknowledging our sponsors and thanking those that have supported us over the year, and we're encouraging others to do so now if and as possible. The focus of this edition of the Florida Food Forum is urban agriculture and how it relates to both the broader general food uh, system in the state, as well as issues related to public policy as they relate to urban agriculture. Although most Floridians today live in urban environments, only a tiny portion of the food that we consume comes from our own state, and even less food comes from our region, and virtually none of it comes from our immediate community. These burgeoning urban centers that really are the identifiable features of Florida today are essentially places where food needs to be imported. As a matter of fact, and somewhat ironically, the vast bulk of the food we consume comes from far away. Most Floridians, as part of American culture, tend to care little about the source of their food and more about its availability and convenience. And again, like most Americans, the food on our plates or at convenience store or at fast food sites travels an average of 1,500 miles before we consume it. 1,500 miles on average for every item that we eat, and this in one of the great agricultural centers of America, the Sunshine State. Case in point, uh, one of our shoppers uh, that works uh, with me in a not-for-profit organization stopped off at an outpost of the industrial food system a few days ago to check on sources of produce. This outpost of the industrial food system is what usually is called a grocery store. The particular item that was being checked was mangoes because mangoes are in season here in Florida, as many of us know. Well, to no surprise, there were plenty of mangoes, but they were all from Mexico. Well, we can do better than Mexico mangoes during the mango season or California oranges during the citrus season or broccoli from the Salinas Valley in California during our winter growing season. But we can't do better than those 1500 mile imports until we get off the dime and make a commitment to local growing, local harvesting, local distribution and seasonal produce. And that's why we're here today. We wanna to talk about urban agriculture policies and programs. So we welcome everyone to this event. A document introducing our outstanding panel of presenters can be found on the council's website. And I encourage everyone to take a look at that for more background and more biographical detail on our presenters. 
As always, my introductions will be very brief, so please do take a look at the more extended bios on the website. So to tell us more about urban agriculture policies and programs, we have the following presenters. First of all, Brandi Gabbard from the St. Petersburg City Council. She's recognized as an expert in issues pertaining to uh, neighborhood sustainability. Also from St. Petersburg, we have Michael Dima and Elizabeth Abernathy. Michael is managing assistant city attorney, specializing in land use, zoning, historic preservation, and environmental matters. And Elizabeth is director of planning and development services for the city. From Pasco County, we have a presentation by Mary Helen Duke, who is not able to be with us today. So we will show parts of her presentation and I will offer some comment on those. And from the city of Newport Ritchie, we have Frank Starkey, who is an architect and real estate developer with deep experience in developing walkable urban places and a national leader in new agrarianism. Or excuse me, new urbanism, I apologize. <laughs> you can see where my thoughts are. New urbanism, apologies. Uh, so much more could be said about our guests, but in the interest of time and moving on with what we need to do today, the real purpose of our event, uh, we're going to get started with our presentations. Welcome, uh, Brandy, uh, to begin our presentation from the St. Pete Way Urban Agriculture. Brandy, welcome indeed. Thank you so much, Dell, and thank you to everyone for having our St. Pete team here today, um, especially our hometown girl, Erica Hall. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here as well and uh, continuing to work with our city to really expand urban agriculture in what I call the St. Pete way. So um, if we could advance to the next slide. All right, so hot, dangerous extremists are coming to your area and they want to bring stronger communities and grow community gardens. So what does that mean? Well, essentially, um, we all know that access to healthy, affordable food is vital for a sustainable community. And that's the really the leading message here in the city of St. Pete. Building strong and healthy communities is one of our number one missions. And we do this through a variety of ways in the city, but urban agriculture has really become one of those cornerstones to this work. Um, earlier this year, um, in fact, just a couple of months ago, the city of St. Petersburg declared food as a human right. And I wanna give just a quick shout out to one of my colleagues I know that's also on here, Councilwoman Gina Driscoll. Um, she actually brought that initiative forward. And so we're really all working in a very concerted effort to be able to provide this human right and also to recognize that healthy food priority areas, or as a lot of us know them as food deserts, continue to exist across our state and are growing every day. Um, in the wake of the pandemic, we have seen this food insecurity issue grow um, to even a greater extent and expand into areas into which we never thought that we would see them before. I'll share just briefly um, a little bit about why this work is so important to me. Um, I grew up in a small town in uh, rural Indiana, as you can imagine, surrounded by farmland, and um, now recognize that I grew up as what was known, what would be known today as a food insecure child in a food insecure family. And um, the saving grace for our family was that every year, my grandfather, who we lived with, was able to grow a very large garden. We had a lot of fruit trees on our property, blackberries, pears, uh, apples, and we were able to share those things with our neighbors. My grandfather was able to sell anything that we had extra, and we were able to uh, can and freeze and live on those things throughout the year. Imagine my surprise whenever I moved to Florida and I became involved with uh, local policy and became an elected official and found out that those things were going to be more challenging to be able to accomplish in the city of St. Petersburg due to um, some legislation at the state level. So um, I want to at this point in time go ahead and turn it over to Michael Dima. 
Um, he is our assistant city attorney, as he was um, introduced earlier, and he's going to give you just a little bit of background on how St. Petersburg came to the policies that we've passed today. So next slide, and I will go ahead and turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Brandy. Um, so hi, everyone. Michael Dima here. And um, yeah, as you can see, we were hearing from the community that they wanted some greater flexibility to, I guess I would say literally, you know, sell the literal fruits of their labor. And you can see that this saga is going to go back to 2009. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these things, but this kind of documents what the city has done over the years to address the growing interest in urban agriculture and also some of the inherent inflexibilities of, of state and local government and how we've navigated that. And I think that where we're at today, what we're about to talk about here is uh, is evidence of that, uh, that effort. So um, it was right around 2013 where we were really trying to break this open and try to you know really create some new uh approaches in our zoning code but uh of course you know legal has to come in and be the bad guy sometimes you know and we're looking at the the florida right to farm act and the florida right to farm act it dates back to the 70s and it does a couple of things it it, it doesn't allow folks to come into and the, the example is, you know, so as, as our cities grew and sprawled outwards, they started bumping up against existing farms. And then they started trying to sue the farms for being a nuisance. And courts and, and, and state legislatures across the country said, no, that's not a good idea. Um, you're, you're coming to the nuisance. We're going to protect our farms. And in doing so, they essentially preempted local government regulation of uh, uh, bona fide agricultural operations. And if I could advance to the next slide, please. Um, actually, how about uh, keep going? One more. And uh, yeah, there we go. So, um, we, you know, we started looking at this act and we're concerned that it was going to stop us from being able to regulate more expanded agricultural operations in our city. We want to do more, but we're concerned that, you know, for however many good actors there are, one bad actor in a residential neighborhood with noise, vermin, smells, that kind of stuff. If we weren't able to regulate them, uh, then we would be doing kind of the same exact thing on the on the opposite side here and uh, destroying the uh, the existing use that was in our urban areas, like single family home residential commercial corridors. We want to protect that first. We want to have farming, but we also need to make sure we're protecting the existing uh, the, the existing uses. And if I could go to the next slide, please. So the act protects farms that have been established for a year or more. And what we're trying to do here is, and, and Liz is going to talk about this in just a moment, um, is to create an ordinance that kind of bumps up against you know our the maximum of what we can do under the act but we also created an exemption um and that was passed by the state legislature this year in the florida urban agriculture act um but what we think we did here is uh with our ordinance that liz is about to talk about is create a lot more opportunities for our, our, our you know our local gardeners to sell their products at their homes and not just have to uh, find a farmer's market. And, and, and we're not just limiting uh, things to the industrial zone for our larger agricultural operations. I think we're really trying to uh, push this into you know, the, the next tier uh, here. And with that, I guess I'll hand it over to Liz Abernathy. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday to you. Um, so next slide, please. So this uh, package of amendments that was adopted last February predates the state statutory change. And really we were trying to take the next deep dive into our code to see if there were ways to uh, expand production and sale of produce in our city. 
so a couple of the changes we made, we uh, tweaked our community garden allowance, uh, eliminated our, our not-for-profit requirement because that was an impediment to um, maybe a neighborhood association or a group of folks that didn't want to go through the process of establishing themselves as a, a 501c3 uh, to establish a garden. So we uh, eliminated that requirement. We also uh, extended our initial permit and lowered our fees related to community gardens. Uh, for commercial gardens and greenhouses, we uh, expanded that as a permitted use in our industrial districts. Previously, it was a special ex exception, which required a public hearing. Uh, if anybody is familiar with Brick Street Farms, uh, that is an operation in the city that had to go through that special exception process in order to establish. Um, they produce uh, greens primarily um, hydroponically in uh, pods, so in, in, in inside um, metal uh, shipping containers that have been converted for that use. So they had to go through that public hearing process. We did uh, help help them through that, but it, it is uh, does slow things down. So next slide, please. We also looked at on-site sale of produce and residential. Um, pretty ubiquitous to prohibit retail in residential neighborhoods, although we have some other state statutory changes that may affect that this next year. Um, so we wanted to make it explicitly uh, a, a right to be able to sell produce at your home. And during the process of updating these ordinances, uh, we came into contact with some folks that are um, Honeybee produced honey and produced honey bee products who also wanted to be able to sell that at, at, at their home. So we expanded it to that. Um, we had a lot of discussion about how many times a year uh, for, in, for uh, comparison, a garage sale in our city is limited to four times a year. We wanted to allow a monthly, um, basically one weekend out of a month, or if there was a growing season, it could be multiple uh, weekends. Um, so we ended up with 36 days per year. Uh, we kind of started out as um, 12 events, but that equated to 36 days. And there were folks that wanted a little more flexibility. So we just went to 36 days. Uh, if you're wondering why that seems like kind of an odd number. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also expanded some allowances to our accessory structures to specifically call out some of these uh, agricultural type accessory structures, cold frames, vertical structures, um, providing for some additional setback encroachments and design exceptions for these type of structures in our residential neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. We also uh, expanded the ability to uh, sell produce uh, in our commercial districts uh, from vacant property from a vehicle. Our code prohibited that type of activity in our city for different type and any type of retail. So we wanted to make an allowance for produce so we could start allowing that uh, throughout our city. Uh, next slide, please. So that really encompasses the changes we made. Um, we do try to uh, provide this information to our community through handouts. And this was a, a handout we produced um, that is available to anyone who's interested. It kind of talks about some of these uh, regulations, what you can and can't do in our city. Uh, next slide, please. And that is the link to that urban ag guide also happy to um you know follow up with anybody if, if you're interested you want to be able to use that uh and mod modify it for your community i can give it to you in word format too um and next slide please so that kind of wraps up what we did this last year to help expand opportunities in our city for production and sale of produce um, with that, I think I'm passing the baton back to um, either Michael or Brandy to talk about what happened this last year with the state uh, state legislature. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Liz. Thank you for explaining the ordinance that we passed earlier. Um, and then, uh, you know, Michael and I, 
I wanted to touch on this and then I'll turn it over to him to kind of explain a little bit about the act itself. But um, when I say it was authored by the city of St. Petersburg, what I mean was it was authored by Michael Dima, to be honest. Um, so Michael and I had, as he mentioned earlier, been through this process of trying to get an amendment to the Right to Farm Act. We'd been through that for a couple of legislative sessions, and um, it became very clear to us that that was not going to be an expedient path forward. And so um, in working with the uh, Department of Agriculture and um, crafting our own ordinance in, um, once again, that St. Pete way, we decided to get a little creative and to actually put forward a standalone bill, um, which ended up being SB 628, the Florida Urban Agriculture Act. As part of the efforts to put that forward, um, we were very blessed to have our own senator from right here in St. Petersburg area, Senator Daryl Rusan, be um, given the appointment as uh, chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee. And so we felt like it was a perfect opportunity to really take this act forward. Um, we've got some photos here where we took uh, Senator Rusan out and we did a tour of some farm operations here in the city of St. Pete so that he could really experience um, what our community was already doing. And um, from that, he was uh, agreeable to actually sponsoring the act. And it was also co-sponsored in the House by Representative Michelle Rayner, who's also from the city of St. Petersburg. So uh, Michael, I'll turn it over to you to go ahead and explain exactly what the act is and what it does. Thank you, Brandy. So yeah, after a couple of years, it turned out that the third time was a charm and we were able to get something passed here. It's really exciting, I think. Um, again, you know, we were having these struggles with the Florida Right to Farm Act. And while um, the efforts that culminated in the passage of our ordinance this year um, you know, we still want to do more. I, we feel like this is an opening salvo in terms of broadening op, uh, opportunities for urban ag in the city of St. Pete. And part of that would be, you know, creating an exemption essentially for dense urban land areas uh, from the Florida Right to Farm Act, because of course the intent was to protect large farms in traditionally rural areas. Um, it makes a lot of sense that um, we create this exemption here and, and allow local governments to regulate this use within their boundaries. And what we ended up getting here, and, and you know, we sell it on a, on a few different things. This is kind of a win-win for everybody, regardless of your political ideology. Um, you know, there's, there's economic development opportunities here, jobs. There's uh, an opportunity to add value to land, particularly, um, you know, in, in some vacant areas where maybe it's a little more difficult to, to build right now for cost concerns or whatever, and then to address food deserts and create more green space in our cities. I mean, there's so many things that come out of this that regardless of where you are on the spectrum politically, there's going to be something for you. And I think eventually, you know, the, the irony here was the Florida Right to Farm Act and the preemption there was preventing more agriculture from happening because cities like St. Pete, and we are far from the only one, uh, speaking of a lot of counterparts across the state over the years on this, and, and we all had cold feet to do too much because again, we had to protect the existing uses, the existing single family residential and commercial corridors of our city. Um, you know, it's again, we want this, but we have to be able to retain some control over it. And we were given some of that control uh, back with the uh, with the act. Now I will note, I will caveat it that um, for whatever reason, you know the you know the state is also uh, you know listening to some other groups and whatnot. So this is only going to be applicable in uh, cities greater than 250,000 people right now. Um, fortunately, um, St. Petersburg is one of those cities, and I believe it's Miami, Jacksonville, Tampa, and Orlando. Um, and, and, and it's being described as a pilot project, but hey, we're in the door here and we want to start doing some of these projects in St. Pete and in the four other cities and show the legislature that, hey, you, you don't have anything to worry about here. This is this is good. This is what people, this is what your constituents want too. So hopefully, um, you know, as we go forward, we're going to 
um, be looking very shortly here at, at how we can take that special exception process that Liz talked about briefly that we eliminated for industrial zones, but now bring it into commercial and residential zones. Have that public hearing say, hey, is this farm, is this project, does this belong in my neighborhood? But now you can make that ask. And, and that's really exciting for us and uh, looking forward to creating some more flexibility and, and room in our code to do that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, we finally made it through this year and it's pretty exciting. So um, I guess if you want to wrap it up for us, uh, Randy, be happy to hand it back to you now. Yeah, um, the last thing that I would like to share with everyone, um, you know, it, urban agriculture is, um, even though I feel like we've done some great work this year, and I'm excited to hear from our friends from PASCO as to what they've been doing, um, the work is far from done. So, um, you know, it's going to take a large collaboration of ideas. And if you could go back to the last slide. Um, another idea, you know, that I listed here that I've been working on with my legislative aide, Kim Amos, and some community members is this idea of a community food forest. I think many of us on here are very familiar with food forests. Um, we have a couple of great examples here in our own city, but food forests are, um, if you didn't know, one of the world's oldest agricultural uses. Um, it is fairly an easy thing to work into your overall um, agriculture uh, plan. And um, they're really about building community, social cohesion, social capital, and beautifying neighborhoods. Um, they can be as large or as small as you have an opportunity for with the space that you have, which I think is equally important in urban areas. And so essentially, um, at this point in time, our city has um, a very concerted effort towards improving our tree canopy. We have an urban forestry team, and it's something we even have a database or the St. Pete tree map is what we call it. So why not use all of those tools that we already have in place to build our community food forest? So we have a lot of residents out there very interested in bringing mature trees that they already have on their property into this program. And then we have other people willing to get involved. And so essentially, if you have publicly accessible areas on your private property where you can plant fruit trees and food um, availability, you know, blackberries, blueberries, whatever you would like to plant, then we can take and we can log those and then the people will know that those are available. The private property owner would actually take care and maintain those trees and those um, assets on their own. And then whenever they came to fruition and the yield was available, they would readily give it to people in the community. So it's really a very simple way of working together collaboratively as a team and getting all of those great benefits that you get from trees in dense urban areas, but adding that extra layer of trees that feed people. So it's an exciting initiative that I've been working on for a while. There's a gentleman, if anyone's familiar with Mr. Rob Greenfield, he has a very um, successful program that he's done in other places interested in working with us here in the city as well. So as it's kind of in its infancy stages, I wanted to tease it out there and get some feedback and um, see if there's anybody from St. Pete, if you just reach out to me, um, we can get you involved. So next slide, please. This is our contact information, and I believe that um, you're probably going to have access to this. But if there is any collaboration, I had seen in the chat someone asking um, if there was kind of a concerted effort across the state for policymakers. We want to be a resource and a tool and a way that we can help to expand these efforts throughout the state. So let's work together on it. Reach out to us. Let us know how we can be helpful. And then um, we'll be here for questions at the end of the presentation. So thank you all so much for your time. OK, well, thank you very much, Brandy, Michael and Elizabeth. A wonderful presentation, very rich, very detailed and uh, very encouraging, inspiring to many, I'm sure, who are hearing this in other parts of the state. Um, we want to uh, turn this over now to Mr. Frank Starkey to talk a little bit about uh, new urbanism and how a urban agriculture uh, ordinance relates to that. Uh, Frank is uh, a resident of the city of Newport Ritchie, which itself has an urban 
uh, agriculture ordinance, one of the very first in the state with all due respect to St. Petersburg, predating yours by just a little bit, uh, but great job that you've done there. Uh, and also, um, uh, we uh, I wanna note too that if time allows, we do wanna do the presentation on, on Pasco County. Before we go to Frank, I do wanna just put one little book up here for people that may be interested in doing some reading on their own. Uh, very short, very accessible text called Public Produce. And it gives uh, the background on how one might go about doing things such as what's being described in St. Petersburg, not in the detail that our, present, that our presenters have shared, but maybe a brief overview about what some of the issues are theoretically and practically. That being said, without further ado, Mr. Frank Starkey. Frank? Thank you, Dale. You may be wondering why in the world there's an architect and, and a real estate developer. We usually are, at least the real estate developers are usually the black hats in the uh, world of urban development. But um, the, the reason I'm here is because I'm a new urbanist by commitment. And one of the things that the, the charter of the Congress for the New Urbanism talks about in, its, in the very first line of its preamble is that the loss of agricultural lands is is interrelated with all of the other pathologies of um, that are going on in the in the world. So, um, it, it, and it, it is part of an interrelated community building challenge. A lot of the work of new urbanists like myself, um, and I've worked in new urbanism as a as a developer, but I'm an architect as well, and so I'm an urban designer by avocation and um, a developer, and I've also been involved with um, the, well, I'm currently on the board of the National, of the Congress for the New Urbanism. One of the fundamental um, proposals of new, urbanism, of new Urbanism is that the zoning that came about um, under the um, Euclid versus Ambler Realty, uh, which was the landmark Supreme Court case that kind of unleash zoning on cities across the country. Um, the problem with zoning that new urbanists, that new urbanism proposes is that it separates uses to a degree that, um, that undermines the cohesiveness of communities. The, the premise of Euclid and the premise of zoning was originally to separate industrial uses from residential uses because of the noxious um, pollution, noise, um, traffic, um, and other um, bad things about industrial activities, um, negatively impacting the quality of life in residential neighborhoods. So the separating Industrial from residential was is kind of where where zoning began. Zoning evolved over years and, and generations and decades to separate more and more things from each other. Now we have one size house separated from another size house um, uh, using zoning on what are what have obviously false pretenses that that different size houses have different. Um, uh, environmental impacts on those things around them. What's interesting to me about urban agriculture is that agriculture at the same time has been has become industrialized as a pursuit generally, as Dell referred to earlier, the industrial agriculture um, uh, world that we live in. And so now ironically, growing food has become viewed as an industrial activity um, that needs to be isolated from residential uses in every way possible. And so now we're ironically having to go back and and amend our zoning ordinances and our land development codes to permit what was a perfectly natural everyday thing that was a part of every house um, and every um, lot in the pre-World pre pre War II period. That's how a lot of families survived through the Great Depression. It's how um, Brandy's family was able to um, uh, survive from the sounds of it. So um, what I'm engaged in currently is the city of Newport Ritchie has contracted me to help advise on rewriting their entire land development code, which is has been kind of a mess. As if you've ever worked with a land development code, you know that they tend to be like a, a 
filing cabinet that's never gotten cleaned out. So there's a lot of extra overlapping, um, uh, often contradictory provisions in the land development code. That whole thing needs to just be looked at comprehensively. So I'm deep in the process of doing that. But there are two, um, as as Dell re referenced, there are actually two components, two chapters in our land development code for the city of Newport Ritchie dealing with urban agriculture. There's a community gardens chapter and there's an urban agriculture chapter. And as part of the rewrite, I, I'm going to put those, I've discussed this with Dell, we're going to put those together in one chapter. Um, but I'm also, I've, I've just um, made a couple of notes from the um, Brandy and Michael and, and uh, Elizabeth's presentation that the I need to deal with this um, art agricultural structures um, in the uh, development standards as well. So that's where that's where I am in this, um, and and that's my that's my role in this at this time. Um, to me, the well to to the proposal of new urbanism, which is to to keep co development compact in order to protect rural agricultural lands, there is also a component of food food production within neighborhoods that's also important. And um, using this, the, the green space that is a part of all of our urban landscapes in the, in the United States, whether it's window boxes or in most cases, especially here in Florida, um, yards, there's an immense amount of acreage of land available for food production in urban area in urban areas. Urban doesn't mean concrete jungle the way that we think it does. It really means um, neighborhoods with uh, where by law we have um, 40 to 50 percent of the lot is required to remain on to, to remain impervious. All of that land is potentially available for um, producing food uh, for all of the reasons that we're um, probably everybody on this call um, uh, agrees with. So that's that's where I am and I'm, I'm happy to be part of this discussion and I've already learned a lot of things here today that are, that are good and I'm looking forward to having more conversations with the other presenters here and maybe other people in the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. And uh, thank you to uh, all of our presenters as well. There's so many uh, books out there, so many articles that could be recommended at this point. I know that uh, many of the folks who are online with us today listening and maybe listening in the future are just extremely interested. I don't want to say desperate, but very interested in resources. What can they pick up? What can they use to go forward in their own communities, large or small? I do want to say, first of all, those that are listening, this document itself will be posted. And by this document, I mean this video programming that we're doing will be posted on the Florida Food Policy website, which also has a library of other events like this over the course of many years, many forums that deal with issues that are related to agriculture in the state of Florida. This itself is an exceptional text. I want to put just one more up here, one more text up here just for information. Rather than giving a bibliography, I'm just going to trust the visual will work. This is a fellow that some of some from St. Petersburg may know, and I know Frank does because we've had conversations about Andre before and, and the work that he's doing. This is a terrific text uh, to my mind. Uh, the title again is Garden Cities, Theory and Practice of Agrarian Urbanism. And it's a very short text. It's really a primer. Um, I think that is extremely accessible. This together with the public produce text would be the two books that I would recommend going forward with uh, your own individual thoughts about uh, how to establish urban, agri uh, urban agrarianism within your own cities, wherever you may be. <clears throat> There's many other cities I might note that could also have been part of our conversation today, Orlando and the work that they're doing over there with the fleet farming operations, some work that's now being done in Tampa for the first time. Uh, obviously, uh, St. Petersburg is a trendsetter in that regard, the work in Newport, Ritchie and Pasco County as well. Um, and we're all learning this. I think uh, the St. Pete folks commented on that as well. Um, we we have, in the great scheme of things, as always, we have relatively little time left uh, uh, for our uh, for our forum for today. And I do want to make sure that we have some time for 
uh, question and answers because I see a lot of stuff coming up in the chat box. But before doing that, I want to take just a minute and share a little bit about Pasco County uh, and how the Pasco County project relates to what uh, Mr. Starkey is talking about, as well as the St. Petersburg team as well. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kendra if she could very briefly uh, put uh, Mary Helen's presentation up uh, on the screen. Okay, Kendra, go to go to slide number four. Um, this is the organization within Pasco County <clears throat> that actually developed the urban agriculture ordinances uh, for the county in cooperation with Mary Helen Duke and the planning department. So unlike the St. Petersburg model, where it really it appears that it came out of council as a result of grassroots efforts, what happened in Pasco County was prior to the ordinance being drafted, there was a food policy advisory council that was created as a result of grassroots work. So the ordinance then was a consequence of the establishment initially of, of, the, of the advisory council. Uh, Kendra, go to five. And this tells you a little bit about the uh, Pasco County Food Policy Advisory Council and what the focus foci are for the council. And again, I'm just making sure that this gets up here as another model for how to go about engaging in the creation of an urban agriculture ordinance and generally urban agriculture policies in any area. One route is perhaps to go essentially through the executive or the legislative branch, which would be the council, uh, the city council or the board of county commissions. And the other route would be to establish a, an advisory board or a citizens board that would take the responsibility for it. I think both of those options are good and helpful, but it depends on where you are and how your particular government works. Let's go to slide number, the next slide, uh, Kendra, which is six, I think. Um, so citizen engagement is very important uh, in how this works and how the word about the work, uh, the word about the work of the council gets circulated and, and deeper into the community. Um, let's go to the next slide, Kendra. So these are some of the initiatives that have occurred and we're, we see the legislative bills that are referenced there as well. Um, and these are some links that are on the Pasco County Food uh, uh, Policy Council website that uh, you uh, that individuals can uh, can review. Uh, Kendra, I want to go to number ten, please. This was the process that was followed in Pasco County to move forward with the urban agriculture ordinance. And this is just like a little calendar that's similar to the calendar that uh, St. Petersburg uh, presented to us as well. Um, let's move on to number sixteen, please. So you can see there's a lot of other stuff. These are um, uh, four different categories that are included in the PASCO ordinance. I don't know how they relate to the St. Petersburg ordinance, but I have a hunch that there's something like that in St. Petersburg. There's four categories. One is a, a, a home garden. The other is a community garden. The other is a market garden, which again is a selling market. And then the third is the community farm. And this is just one model. And again, this is available on the Pasco County Food Policy Council website, as well as additional information about how that ordinance actually works. So I'm just putting this up here as sample categories. And when maybe when we have discussion, St. Petersburg folk can talk with us about those categories. And there are uh, similar categories in the Newport Ritchie ordinance as well. Um, let's go all the way on to 27. And there's obviously so much more in Mary Helen's presentation that I'd like to be able to share, but I am interested in kind of hitting the high points. One thing that was very important early on in uh, the work of the Pasco County Food Policy Council was getting an idea of what, about what the distribution system was for the locally grown material. So as several of us have mentioned already, most of the food that we consume is imported. It comes from other parts of the country or even other parts of the world. The vast majority of it coming from California. Yet we here in the state can produce, we could produce enough food to feed, to feed the state if we had an intention to do so, but we certainly could in significantly increase the amount of food that's being grown within our cities. 
But growing the food is one thing, distributing it is another. And I know St. Petersburg is wrestling with how to get that food uh, into the market and distributed in efficient ways with, um, what is it, your 36 days of selling that are allowed uh, on site. Well, uh, we to improve our understanding and our distribution, we wanted to do a farmer's market uh, survey to understand where the points of sale were. So that was an important part of the Pasco County uh, project. Um, Kendra, to wrap it up, let's go to uh, number 37. And again, there's so much more that could have been said and, oh, well, that's not the right number on your slides to show. This was something that I think is important for everyone that's thinking about putting together an organization, either public or private, that's going to serve as an advisory council. And that's to make sure that you have good representation on the council or on the board or on the committee that's going to be advising on these issues. So this is what um, Pasco County put together as far as the representatives to serve on the Pasco County Advisory uh, Board. And this is the group that went about establishing the Urban Agriculture Ordinance, first of all, by doing a food systems survey, uh, a deep analysis of the system as it existed in Pasco County, then made sure to include the points of distribution for the uh, uh, produce, for the products that were, were uh, developed in the urban areas, but then was very interested in promoting and developing the uh, resources as well as the information and education that was necessary to the residents of the county so that they became more aware of the importance of localism in their food choices. That will conclude the presentation on Pasco County. Again, uh, we could say much more on that, but we do wanna open it up in a little bit of time that we have for a few of the questions. And I know Kendra has been picking them up out of the chat box. So let's move on to that. Kendra, if you would, please. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and I just want to note, if we aren't able to get to your question today, please um, reach out to any of our speakers. I believe they've all put their information into the chat box. Or you can also reach out to us at info at flfpc.org, and we'll make sure to direct your questions to the right people. Let's actually go back um, a little bit. There was a, a question um, from... Uh, James asking, how do you handle technical knowledge dissemination with residents? Are there trainings um, for tree maintenance or gleaning efforts to make sure food doesn't go to waste? I think um, maybe uh, if uh, Brandy, if you want to talk, are there any technical um, knowledge dissemination efforts um, that you want to share about? <laughs> So are we talking about all of the policies in general? Because if that's the question, absolutely. Um, I actually was just with our Healthy St. Pete um, initiative group this morning discussing these very same um, conversations and what opportunities are available. And so, yes, um, we have been working very closely with our uh, community who is interested in this work. Um, we have some great existing farms now that um, do a lot of community outreach. They are all very familiar with what is going on, and we have spoken at numerous of those events. Um, but, you know, with our urban agriculture guide that we shared earlier, and really just making sure that we're trying to get as much information in the hands of people as we can and speak at as many events as we can. Um, now, as far as the food forest idea, that, like I said, is still in its infancy stages training and um, you know adding that into our guide will certainly be important. Um, so yes, uh, education and delivery of the tools is certainly key to long-term success. Thank you. And it looks like there's a few hands up. Um, I see a hand from uh, Derek. Would you like to ask your question? Please, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes. Three parts to this, really. I'm, I'm the beekeeper. I'm the beekeeper that basically uh, worked with Elizabeth to get the whole beekeeping part involved here. And I just want to add to you people here, we used to believe that bees could forage comfortably for two miles. I recently had information from one of our local beekeepers that half a mile is a better number. So if you don't have bees within about half a mile or at most a mile of where you're trying to grow your pro property, your, your produce, you won't have good pollination, okay? So this should be 
part of the whole core of this whole urban agriculture. If you don't have pollinators, you're going to have a problem. Um, the second part was, Brandy, I'd like to contact you later about, um, and I don't have your contact information here, about trees and, and getting involved with that. Um, and the last part was back to the lawyer, Michael. I'm afraid, could you sum up what was achieved in, the, in, in, in a sentence or two? Um, I could not follow what you actually achieved by the, the bill that you got passed this year. Well, in short, we uh, were able to create an exemption to the prohibition on local regulation of uh, of urban agriculture. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question, Kendra. Uh, thank you. Um, I see we have a hand raised from Cindy Dwyer. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Thank you. Can Can everyone hear me? First of all, I'd like to say that I'm an urban planner and a backyard farmer, so I found this all very fascinating. Thank you for offering this. It was so so um, pertinent to me. And I think my question was partially answered because it really was, I mean, I'm somewhat familiar with the Florida Right to Farm Act, you know, which is designed to protect existing agriculture from urban encroachment, basically. And I didn't get a miss where it was it became a problem for local agriculture but i guess it was it's just a preemption idea in general it wasn't that it had like a prohibition against local farms versus existing traditional agriculture right that's correct it's really the uh the preemption on local regulation of it so our concern was that should bona fide agricultural operations be established in the city after one year, we would lose the ability to regulate them. And if we had bad actors, you know, again, thinking noise, odors, vermin, that kind of stuff uh, coming into our neighborhoods and our commercial corridors, and we would be unable to regulate it. That's that's why we weren't able to go forward with something more bold uh, before. And now maybe we're looking to, 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 to go down a bolder route. And if I could just add to that as a policymaker, um, it's very, very important always as we're making these changes within side of our residential neighborhoods that we have the ability to be able to get buy-in from our community. And so one of the ways that we really um, stand up to the I hate to use a housing term, but the not in my backyard kind of mentality is being able to give our neighborhoods the um, confidence that we will regulate those things that could potentially impede on their quality of life. And so that's why it was so vitally important that we be able to get legislation passed that would allow us to do that. And because we're able to do that, I really feel like it has cut down on the level of um, kickback maybe that we may have gotten from people who did not understand what we were doing, why we were doing it, and wouldn't think that we were doing it well. This regulation really allows us to make sure that we are meeting both sides of the need. And you, you have the power and the authority to tell people that now. Okay, thank you. That that clarifies my question. Thank you. Well, that and that's just great. Um, unfortunately, as is often the case with the Florida Food Forum, is we're out of time. <laughs> These are one-hour events, so I do appreciate everyone being concise in their presentations. We were able to get a lot of information out there. I see some people uh, clapping their hands using that electronic device that shows a hand clapping, but I'm clapping mine just physically and literally. Uh, so well done. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, Brandy, uh, Michael, Elizabeth, Frank, Kendra, and uh, all the folks tuning in. I think we had one of the largest audiences that we've had before. And just because of the level of interest that we have, let's go ahead and do this one again. And uh, as time goes forward, we might make this even a regular, I don't want to say quarterly, but maybe annual event where we talk about urban food policy and how that relates to the ordinances that allow that to happen. This is Erica. I just wanted to quickly thank everyone, especially Brandy, Michael, Frank, everyone from Pasco, but St. Pete, uh, appreciate 
your leadership and all the work that you've done. And people have been very uh, anxious and excited to hear how you all did what you did. So again, big shout out to the St. Pete team, Brandy, uh, Gina, Michael, Elizabeth, and everyone for your hard work. I appreciate you all every day for what you do to make our lives better in the city of St. Petersburg. Thank you, Erica. And so we want to say goodbye now. And we want to also, with all due respect, thank our supporters, um, Anthony Oliveri with Freed and Jay Haskins Law. So if you're interested in what thank we're doing, then go to the Florida Food Forum, uh, Florida Food Policy Council website, and also think about sharing a donation with the Florida Food Policy Council. All right, for everybody. Thanks, everyone.